This is a control surface, and this, this is an audio interface. Now, wouldn't it be neat if we could somehow combine them? PreSonus decided to take their 24C audio interface and fuse it with a fader port control surface. Now, this isn't exactly a new idea. Tascam did it back in 2003 with the Firewire 1884, and M-Audio had a crack at it in 2006. And Behringer has kept the dream alive with the X32. Time for a quick deboxing. We get the IO Station 24C. Not one, but two USB cables, a power supply, some adapters, and a manual with sticky feet. Let's take off the cover and peel off the sticker. You know what, I'm gonna save that. Make some soup later. We have some basic controls starting with a motorized fader. Down here, we have transport, stop, play, record, loop, fast forward, and rewind. Up top, we have solo, mute, arm, and shift. Pressing that allows you to access the secondary functions of each button. Then we have this jog knob. It's like a jog dial, but with 100% more knob. And a quick check with the science scissors tells me that it is in fact metal, so at least it has that going for it. Outside of that, we have link, pan, channel, scroll, along with a few others, and four function keys. On the right side, we have our audio interface controls. Nothing crazy here. We have a line level switch, phantom power for condenser microphones, and of course a volume for the two preamps. Then we have a mix control for input and playback, headphone volume, main volume output, and a mute button. On the back, there's a power button, a USB 2 Type-C connector, foot switch, headphones, balance left and right output, and two PreSonus X Max preamps. Let's get those drivers installed and configured. I'm going to plug the USB cable in and we're done. Welcome to Linux. In Pavu Control, we can take a look at the configuration options. The chip supports a bunch of digital I.O., but none of that's accessible on the device itself, but we do have stereo duplex, stereo output, and of course stereo input. Now time for some jack in QJack CTL. We're going to select the ALSA driver, then the I.O. station from the interface dropdown. 48K, 128 frames, and two for the buffer. Click on apply and let's see if it starts. There we go. Now we check the graph and see what we have. All right, playback one and two, capture one and two, and MIDI. It's gonna be interesting to see if that just works, TM. Let's give it a try. This is a 10 minute recording session Reaper using Jack. Both the inputs and the outputs are connected. We're checking for clicks and pops in the audio, AKA Xrons as they're known under Linux. And I'm happy to report clean, Bill of help. On to round trip latency, this tells us how fast we can get audio into and out of the interface. At 44.1, we're just under 7 milliseconds at a period of 64. Pretty much the same story at 48k. 96k gets us down in the fives, limited at 128, and we're looking at 6 milliseconds at 192, limited to 256 frames. This puts the I.O. station at the top of the charts, just behind the Tascam 1608. Check one, two, check one, two. Let's get it up to minus 18. That's about where we want to be. Where are we at? Um, maybe around 85, 90% of available gain on the preamp. This is a Golden Age D2. It requires about 50, 56 dB of gain to get up to level. But this is raw, unprocessed. Let's go ahead and cut on the FX chain. This is everything kicked in with EQ, compression, and um, an expander, which is kind of like a noise gate. It's just a bit more flexible with the Golden Age D2. Up next, let's take a listen to the classic and test out this phantom power, all 48 volts of it. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. We're getting up to about 18, minus 18. This is the Audio Technica AT2020. It's the classic. You probably got one check under your bed, but it gives us a chance to find out if our 48 volt phantom power is working. Pretty good. We're about 75% on the gain. And this is the raw input directly going into our PreSonus. So let's go ahead and cut on the processing chain. Give that a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is everything cut on, and by everything, I mean an expander, EQ, and of course, a compressor coming into our PreSonus 24CIO station. It's such a weird name, but there we go. Mic check. 
complete. Okay, here we are in Outdoor. Let's play around with this and find out what works. I'm gonna head over to Preferences and... Control Surfaces, Fader Port 2, because this is based on the Fader Port 2, not the original one. Let's click on Settings. All right, there it is. We can do the IO Station 24C in and out. We do have the function keys, that's kind of neat. So, oh, wow, all right. These are really handy. I'm really surprised to see these built in. Good job, Outdoor developers. So anything you can come up with, play around with that if you get a chance. So let's close this and start pressing buttons and find out what works and what doesn't. I'm gonna start with the channel. Ooh, there we go. Fader's working. That's on my master fader and that's going up and down. Next, moving down to chairs. We'll move that to chairs too. Move that to News 2. All the way down to Steam. Okay, we have Recall. We're getting the Fader Recall, that's nice. Oh, hmm, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, okay, I think that's scrolling. I believe that's scrolling. Maybe it's scrolling. <laughs> um, that's next. I feel like we're debugging this. Okay, mute, solo, record, that's all there. Hmm, right? Okay, that's gonna be for our automation. We'll play with that in a minute, hopefully. Shift, yeah, I'm really curious how the shift works. Well, I know how it should work in theory. Maybe that's what I should say. Let's put some automation on one of these tracks. Let's put Fader in. We're just going to move this around. Let's check Transport. That's up. Okay, that's still doing that. So what happens if I do something crazy like hit scroll? Oh, look at that, it scrolls. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Man, we've solved a very, very tricky problem there by pressing the button that says scroll. So that's working. I don't I don't like the blue jog dial though. I'm gonna put automation on right now. Click play, click play, we're gonna press play. So when I move this, if you don't know what's going on here, um automation curves, you can just write this because you know it's non-destructive editing. And I'm giving data points to the DAW and say, hey, I need this part to go down, be louder, be quieter. So when I play that back for recording, you can see the fader moving around. This is just a easy way to show, and you can automate, um, you know, mutes, tons of stuff. You can even do it with the plugins. Anything that has an automation perimeter, you can write to. This is just an, one that I would expect to work. Markers is another one that is really important. Oh, hey, okay, neat. I like that. I don't like that enough to say I like the uh, jog knob, but I like that. That's handy. Use markers, you know, when you need notes. You're like, hey, go back and investigate this. Can I jump between the markers? Maybe. Hmm. Okay, okay, hit marker. And that jumps around. This is pretty neat. This is pretty neat. Back to scroll. Yeah. Couple of minutes, we got this figured out. All of our basic stuff works. That should be fast forward and rewind there. Stop and play. All of our transport works. 
go back to channel. Yeah, I got this figured out. Solo. Hmm. Yeah, pretty happy with this. Pretty happy with this. I mean, this is completely usable without any additional setup. Again, have to play around with that shift button and get used to it. Okay, moving on to Reaper. Let's head down to Preferences and Control OSC Web. Reaper's not great with control surfaces. I'm not going to pretend it is. It's the DAW that I use to record all of our shows, but, you know, let's talk about its faults. This is definitely one of them. There is support for the Fader Port V2 out of the box. I don't know how well it's going to work out of the box, but we're, we're, we're going to try it out. I know an application called Resonus for Windows exists for Reaper, and that's usually not a good sign. Let's click OK and find out what we have access to. Okay, Fader works, Solo works. Mute. Arm for record, okay, that's working. And all right, that's changing our automation. So right touch. I don't know about the shift key though. I'm willing to bet we're not gonna have access to any of the shift functions. How about scroll? Dun dun dun, spoilers. I kinda knew that didn't work. We can make it change colors and not do anything. Yeah. Previous and next, no joy on that. We'll go over to channel. It's not gonna change channels. I tried this in Mackie mode before I put it in um, 24C mode and it kinda spazzed around a little bit with the ability to change channels, but it was like laughably unpredictable. So yeah, none of that's going to work. Link, pen, channel, scroll. These are just collections of useless buttons under Reaper. Really nothing to be done, which is bad because I'd like to get a hold to like the function keys or something. It's just not there. It's just not there. Basically you have, you know, solo mute arm and your automation. Fortunately, the transport does work. So we can hit play. Stop. Loop. And this should give us fast forward. And rewind. And we're going to go out on a limb and say the record button works as well. There it goes. It's recording. Stop. I would say extremely ordinarily limited under Linux, but let's test out the automation. Let's put a volume automation and mute. Why not? Let's level a little and test out the two bits. So I need to put this into right. What's going on? Let's get back on the right track. Okay. I'm gonna hit write. Okay, so we're writing automation. Now hit play, and we should be able to just fader. There we go, so our volume automation. That's working, I, I assume that was going to work, which is good. And let's double check and make sure our mutes work. Let's take off shift, there we go. So we've learned that the shift button does something, and by that, it makes other buttons not work when it's pressed. The few buttons that do work, Make sure you don't have shift pressed in. Yeah. So this is pretty much what we end up with, with the, and it's not just the IO Station 24. So if this is um, just the regular Gen 2 control surface. This is going to be the exact same experience that you're going to get with a Reaper without the Resonus package application. Um, I'm not sure the right word for it. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it's Windows only. It doesn't work under Linux. And I was reading up about that before this device showed up, so I kinda had a feeling it was going to be a bit squirrely under Reaper by itself, but if you watched any of the previous videos, you know, just setting up MIDI CC and um, Mackie under Reaper requires some additional applications as well, but fortunately those work under Linux. And um, yeah, out of the box, you get your basic mutes, your arms, you can write automation, but Everything below that, all of these buttons, 
you know, master markers, being able to scroll. So that's going to limit your ability to pan. You're not going to be able to change tracks. It's very, very limited. You get basic transport. And that's it. And of course your fader works. So there we go. So as a control surface, how does the IO Station 24C stack up against the X-Touch 1? Well, it's got this knob. I'm not a fan of it. I like a jog dial where I can put my finger on it and move it around without having to get up close and personal. I like that you can press it in. That's pretty decent. Transport controls, you know, your play, stop, record. They're about the same. They're about the same. Not really a big deal either way. Faders are both fine. No complaints about the fader on the PreSonus IO station. Gets the job done. The function keys, you're limited to four function keys on that. And you gotta press that shift button. And it works unless you're on Reaper. I like the fact that the X-Touch 1 just has all of them. Right there, you got six ready to go. Then there's the lack of the time code or scribble strip. Like, they're not there. I'm going to cut on the X-Touch 1 and... Up here at the top, I can keep track of my hours, minutes, and seconds, just my time code options or beats per minute, which is really handy to be able to glance down. And the scribble strip will tell me what track I'm on or what I need to pan or anything like that. PreSonus knows how to make these. They just don't include it on the budget model. And it's missing fader banks. And I got this nice little trim pot up here that's, you know, dual mode. I would expect that. And the X-Touch 1 also has a dedicated zoom and movement controls. Yeah, all of this is missing from the IO station or just the fader port V2. And one of the things that really winds me up is this USB 2 with the USB Type-C connector. Yeah, like that's going to break off, just mechanically speaking. And here's another one. The back of this guy, it is made out of um, less than stout plastic. I'm pretty sure if I smacked it just with my knuckle, I could crack right through it. And that worries me a little bit for like the longevity of the device. Where Behringer, again, we're talking about Behringer here. This is a, not the bastion of quality. The X-Touch 1. Metal on the front, metal on the back. Plastic on the sides. So, you know, if you drop this guy, you're going to chip the sides, but you might dent the controller. You drop this guy, you're going to crack the bottom and probably shear off that little USB-C connector. And you want to keep that in mind. You know, I really wanted to like the IO Station 24C. It's doing something different. The X-Max preamps only have around 50 dB of usable gain. It requires external power, no scribble strip, no time code, not a fan of the jog dial or the shift key interface. The motorized fader, perfectly serviceable. Outdoor support is absolutely fantastic, and it does work out of the box on Linux. However, at an MSRP of $249.99, that leaves a lot to be desired. Fortunately, you can find them on the used market between 150 and 170 USD. And at that price, it's not a bad value proposition. Also, big thanks to Kaijori for picking this up from our Amazon Wish Zone. Go check out his channel for additional Linux shenanigans. There'll be a link down in the description. Speaking of that, we have an Amazon Wish Zone and a Patreon if you'd like to help out. It's a very expensive project to undertake, but I think it's worthwhile. And head over to linuxgamecast.com for a list of previously tested interfaces along with benchmarks. Like and subscribe. Leave any questions you have in the comments, and most importantly, get out there and make something awesome.